drop out of the night like a bullet from a gun Till every shadow is scattered, every dragon's on the run Oh, I believe, I believe that the light is gonna come And this is the dark, this is the dark before the dawn The church has seen dark times before but the darkness is always darkest, just before the dawn arrives. Today, as we look forward, we also look back to one of the most famous Christians in history, whose ministry began with a literal church rebuilding project. He was the son of a wealthy merchant. He squandered much of his youth in worldliness and trivialities with dreams of military glory that ended in embarrassment as a prisoner. One day, he walked into a dilapidated church building that was literally falling apart all around him. And it was there he heard God say, Francis, go repair my house, which you see is falling into ruin. Francis of Assisi took the command literally. He sold off his belongings so he could fund the project, and he raised money for repairs. He faced opposition from his family, including his father, leading to an unforgettable showdown when Francis stripped off all his clothes as if to renounce all his possessions and transfer his allegiance once and for all from his earthly father to his heavenly father. But God had plans for Francis that went beyond the reconstruction of one particular church building. He was a type of reformer three centuries before the Reformation. He saw with clarity the sins that were plaguing the church of his time. He was clear-eyed about the rot in the church of his day, the hypocrisy, the immorality of church leaders, the worldliness and materialism of Christians. And yet, he never wavered in his love for the church. He never despised the church. Even with all its failures and flaws, sins and sorrows, the church was the bride of Christ. And Francis remained loyal and dedicated to seeing the bride look more like the groom. And there's a lesson there for us. We will not have the courage and patience to do the deep work of reform in the days ahead unless we are filled with love for the bride of Christ. One must love the church before seeking to renew her. I've been waiting for some peace To come raining down out of the heavens On these war-torn fields All creation is aching for the sons of God to be revealed Oh, I believe, I believe that the victory is sealed The serpent struck, but it was crushed beneath his heel As you look at the church today, you may find yourself feeling much like Francis of Assisi. You ache for the church when so much of our witness looks a lot like that dilapidated building Francis once stood in, ruined by hypocrisy, the ceiling caving in under the weight of so many challenges. But maybe you ache because you love. You love the church and know she can be better than this. And you love Jesus and know he deserves a bride whose beauty showcases his as we bring this season of Reconstructing Faith to a close, we're going to talk with several servants of the church, with Tim Keller, Jen Wilkin, and Ajith Fernando. They have insight into how we might see renewal in the days ahead. These are constructive voices who want to see the church strengthened and built up. Yes, we've experienced a season of humiliation and pain in which the Lord has seen fit to expose our sins and failures, but tragedies and disasters have a way of clearing the mind of clutter and focusing the heart. So let's clear the debris and focus on what's central. And let's prepare for the adventure of reconstruction and repair. I'm Trevin Wax, Vice President of Research and Resource Development at the North American Mission Board. You're listening to Reconstructing Faith, in this series, we address the church's credibility crisis, reflecting on the challenges of today while learning from church history and the church around the world. 
I hope you'll join me on this journey and consider what you can contribute to the task of restoring and rebuilding the church's witness so that the world would experience the majesty of Jesus. This is episode 12, the season finale. It's time to rebuild. So I think what the church needs to recover is a passion for God. This is Ajit Fernando. He's currently the teaching director for Youth for Christ in Sri Lanka, after serving as national director for 35 years. He is the author of 16 books, which have been published in 20 languages. If you have a passion for God, you'll be desperate desperately looking for people. Of course, when you look for people, uh, friends are going to disappoint and you'll have many disappointments. But when you keep looking, God is going to provide us with the type of friendship that the Bible talks about. So I really try to tell people, pray for a passion for holiness. Then you will seek friends to help you along this path towards holiness. I talked with Ajith about the credibility crisis facing the church in North America, some of the scandals we've seen recently. He quickly put those scandals in perspective, but then offered insight into how we can avoid ministry failures in the future. As I think about your scandals, actually, uh, the scandals have been there in the church all along, and our churches also have scandals, so this is not something that is exclusive to the West or to North America. But as I see as an outsider, the church has imbibed the the idea of this celebrity culture. And we are putting up celebrities, elevating celebrities, enabling them to be superstars, you know. Now, we, we have a similar problem, but a different source. And that is that in Hinduism, there are these God men who can do no wrong or whatever they do is right. And they have great power. And so we also have celebrity culture, though it's a different place from which it comes. But what happens is the people get become celebrities and they get so above the rest. And the rest have to keep this machinery going. They have to keep the image of the, of the leader exciting. And then what happens is, you know, we are all weak people in need of grace, in need of a community that helps us. But this community is no longer able, the leader has become so distant to them that the community is no longer able to minister, caution, help to these people. And of course, leadership increases opportunity for wrongdoing. So what is happening is that the grace for holiness that is often mediated through the body is now not accessible to these leaders because they have become celebrities. And I think one of the great needs today is to make sure that our leaders are accountable, not only financially, but also in terms of their character and their personal life. Very often, character flaws come out with a scandal, but they should have been dealt with long ago. If you are a part of a body, the body knows, at least a few few people know what the weaknesses are. Early confession helps to avoid major scandal. And I think this practice of confessing to um, accountability partners is something that is lacking. What, what do you see as some of the challenges in American culture that would, that would keep us from doing that? I mean, you mentioned celebrity culture would be one, but I just wonder... What are some of the the particular things that you see in Western culture that makes it difficult for people to seek out others to aid them in their pursuit of holiness? One of the things that I have been thinking about is that the church in the West has been the majority religion for a long time. And we don't have that problem. We have a lot of problems in Sri Lanka, in our church in Sri Lanka. But this is not a problem for us because we have always been a minority. There is social ostracism and even persecution in Sri Lanka. The constitution gives Buddhism preferred status. Local governments sometimes participate in attacks on pastors and churches. The Christian minority is partly tolerated, but converts to Christianity are not. Good evening from Sri Lanka, where the authorities are blaming a local Islamist group 
for the Easter Sunday attacks, which have left 290 people dead and 500 others injured. This is a news report from 2019, Easter Sunday, when Islamic terrorists set off three bombs in three churches in three different parts of Sri Lanka. This may be the worst example of persecution in Sri Lanka in recent years. Oppression usually takes shape in the form of mass protests and small mobs that target Christians and call for the removal of churches. Christians who had been used to being a majority perhaps got comfortable with that. And now they are ceasing to be like this. They are, they are ceasing to be a majority religion. However, biblical Christians have always been a minority. The Bible says that the great to destruction is wide, whereas the road to life is narrow. So Christians are always a minority. So I think being in, in a minority situation is going to give the Christians in North America a better chance to be biblical Christians without the social props that being in the majority gave them. Now they are able to look at the world, to approach the world with a passion for the lost. These people need Jesus Christ. That becomes our quest, not only a quest for power, but also a quest for souls, to see people saved. Sadly, I think we Christians have got a name of being people who are intent on, on protecting our control, the control that we have had on society. Maybe we will lose some of the control, but maybe that would give us an opportunity to influence through being salt and light. And that will make us more effective gospel-wise. We will look at society consisting primarily of people who need salvation, people who need Christ. Indeed, Christians will go into society, they will work towards changing structures, and this is all part of Christian witness, and that is needed. But for most of us, our call is to become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, we can save some. But I'm wondering if what else you would focus on if you're if you're speaking to us as an outside observer saying, you know, looking at the church today, what you would say the American church, what are the gifts in other parts of the world that the American church could benefit from? You know, I have lived uh, about six years of my life in, in North America, in USA, and uh, I love the country. I love the people and I, uh, they have been so good to me. I worked in a church in a very affluent church for some months as an intern. And I still remember, I, I, I used to ride a bicycle and I used to go in this little town, up and down, praying for the, for the town, that God will bring revival to the town. And one of the things I prayed is, Lord, send suffering to these people. They are too comfortable. Send suffering so that they know what it is to seek God. God gave me the great privilege of working with the poor. I, for the last 40 years or so, my grassroots ministry has been with the poor and also with leaders who come from poor backgrounds. And there is something that the poor teach us, people who have come from difficult situations. They know how to pray because they know how to be in need. They know how to be desperate. And I think this is one of the great blessings of poverty that people get more and more dependent on God. And dependence on God, a childlike spirit of dependence on God, is the heart of godliness. So I think if we can teach our people to be more dependent on God, this could be one of the things that, uh, that will teach, uh, that will help people and bring revival to North America. And that lesson could well come through suffering, through hardship, through difficulty. I want to follow up on something you just said there about praying for Americans to experience suffering as a way of growing closer in dependence to God. Uh, some may hear that and be shocked by that and want to say, well, but don't we pray for the relief of suffering when we think of Christians in other parts of the world or Christians that are 
you know, that are struggling or that are facing persecution or martyrdom or whatnot. Well, so what would you say to those who would say, we're calling for God to, to relieve and take away suffering, and yet you're, you're thinking suffering is something that might actually be of spiritual benefit? This, I suppose, you could call the paradox of Christianity, one of the paradoxes of Christianity. I, I really appreciate the fact that people pray for us when we go through difficulty. But I think the, the biggest prayer should not be for the relief of suffering, but for us to be faithful amid suffering. When the church experienced persecution for the first time in Acts chapter 4, their prayer was that they will be faithful to the Great Commission. And so I think that should be the biggest prayer. But the suffering part of it, a means, I, th I think uh, it's a means of reminding us of the, of the greatest blessing of Christianity. I, I really think that the most wonderful thing about being a Christian is the joy of being a child of God. That's, that's something that is amazing. That's our greatest wealth. And, and I think... Uh, one of the things that I, I desire for people to have is to know that their joy in Christ is not going to be ruined because of suffering. And, and, and sometimes you have to experience that in order to believe that and to, and to know that. So the, the spiritual benefit is something that can only come through suffering. If you look at the scriptures, there's so much to say about the essentiality of suffering. Take up your cross and follow me. You know, don't be ashamed of me in this crooked and perverse generation. This is an essential aspect. And, and again, I think a part of the suffering that uh, Western Christians are going to have is because of being part of a community. This is another problem with the individualism that has grown in the West and now is growing in our part of the world too. We are looking at church as consumers, what does this church have to offer? People talk about, I, I, I want to go to a church where I'm comfortable. I don't think the church was ever expected to be a comfortable place because Christians are cross-bearing people. And sometimes the biggest cross we have is from our fellow Christians. But what has happened is, because we look at church in terms of consumer, as, as, as consumers, what does this church have to offer me? When there are problems, we leave the church. Whereas maybe God is asking us to be committed to this community. What stands out to me about Ajith's comment here is not that he is praying Christians in the West would experience violence or persecution. He's talking about a more mundane experience of suffering that comes first from being a religious minority, and secondly, that comes about through faithfulness to the Christian community even when it's tough and our brothers and sisters are hard to deal with. We bear the cross and we bear the cross of the community. A consumeristic mindset shields us from suffering because it shields us from true community. But there is no such thing as true Christianity without some sort of suffering. Even if that suffering means we endure slights and insults from neighbors or stay committed to the church, when we bear with fellow Christians who may hurt us or do us wrong, suffering is a path to sanctification. It's common today to hear of people leaving the church because of scandal, to think that the church is a problem, an obstacle to my personal faith. But when we listen to voices from outside the West, it becomes clear how central the community is. An overly individualistic, just me and Jesus Christianity is not an option. I asked Jen Wilkin, author and Bible teacher, how she'd respond to people who say, ah, oh, the church is too messed up. I don't need it at all. Well, first I would say I can relate. I mean, nobody wants to be, nobody wants to feel like they've been made a fool of. Nobody wants to feel like they have put their trust in someone who was untrustworthy. And so I can understand the emotion behind that. I have a harder time with the logic behind that. And I don't mean to reduce this to a simple rational act. Belonging to a church is more than a rational act. But 
I, I would argue that the overarching story of the Bible is the church is the family of God, and that in the same way that we need a family of origin to understand who we are, we need an extended family of believers to understand who we are. And so even though our our families of origin are often painful spaces for us. We understand that there's a cost to abandoning them entirely. And so we would do that, you know, with sober mindedness at the very least, I would hope. I would think that within the the local church or a universal church, we stand a much better chance of finding a space where we can explore truth together and have deep relationship with one another. Your nuclear family is pretty small and your church is pretty big which means that probably not everybody in it is a total jerk. You know, it's, it's fascinating to me how much in, in Western culture individualism has impacted our views on this, right? We actually do think we would be better off alone. And, and I think it's important for those who want to remove themselves from the church to examine the roots of that idea. Like, why do I think that it's better for me to be on my own in this? I think we sometimes underestimate the amount of messaging that we have received, like, we have been spiritually formed, whether it was actively or passively. And, and individualism has spiritually formed many of us into thinking that a quiet time is discipleship, right? That just me and my Bible is discipleship. And if you have been transmitted a message that going it alone is going to work, then you've been transmitted the wrong message. But the Bible does not teach that. In fact, it teaches the opposite. And so I think being honest about the feelings behind wanting to do that and being honest about why that idea sounds tenable, uh, doing some hard work, looking at how we got to why we feel that way. Is it John Stott who said an unchurched Christian is an anomaly in the New Testament? Like you, it's it's really unthinkable. And I, and I think throughout church history, too, it would be seen as unthinkable. So yes. There are some that could look at what we've been talking about in this podcast, and you could say, well, you know, there are a lot of churches that have the right doctrinal stances. They call themselves Bible-believing churches, and that has not been a fail-safe when it comes to abuse, injustice, sin. How do you respond to that challenge? You know, no, there's no fail-safe for people to not have someone in authority in their church who ends up being a jerk or a liar, because jerks and liars are attracted to positions of authority. I do think that our perception of how pervasive this is and thinking that we're in a unique moment in time might be a little short-sighted in terms of history. We live in an information age, which means that just as we've seen so many other things exposed, not just within the church, but outside the church as well, you know, we should expect that more things are going to come to light. What we should probably not expect is that the human heart has grown in wickedness over the last 2,000, 4,000 years. But we're learning more about it, and there is an impact to our souls related to that. But what I find on the regular is that people who've sat in church for years don't know the Bible. They would fail a simple, factual pop quiz. I actually give one when I speak a lot so that we can all understand that we are in the same boat on all of this. And that means that for much of our Christian journeys, we have simply been taking someone else's word for it. And that's not a good place to be in as a Christ follower, even if you end up having to leave the church that you're in because you have seen an exposure of unfaithfulness or of dishonesty. The idea that you would leave and not join another church means that you don't know what the Bible says about church, right? I mean, even the fact that people would think they could go it on their own is a display of a, of a lack of, of just basic Bible understanding. I have wondered so often if many who have abandoned the Christian faith have left a faith that they knew in the first place. And I don't say that as a judgment on the person who left. That's an indictment on church leaders. That's an indictment on people like me who have an opportunity to impact that and have instead said, I'll just tell you what it says and what it means. Jen believes we need more scripture, not less, if we are going to counter the formative aspects of our culture that diminish and distort our view of the church. And the more we go to scripture, the better equipped we will be to see and respond to sin in our own lives and in the church. When we look at the fallout from so many of the church's failures, we can still look to Christ and look to his word. And when we read the letters in the New Testament, we are reminded that the church is ever and always in a state of warfare against sin and Satan. 
Just as the individual must crucify the flesh and live according to the Spirit, so also must the church. We are redeemed, but not yet glorified, saved, but not yet perfected. There's Holy Spirit-powered work to be done. We'll be right back. I want to tell you about the New Churches podcast. This is a podcast that offers practical answers to real ministry questions. Uh, We aren't going to provide lofty pie-in-the-sky theories. Instead, we're going to help you in your real ministry context with your real thoughts, questions, and issues. Uh, New Churches features expert church planters and leaders like Ed Stetzer, Dahati Lewis, J.D. Greer, David Platt, and more. The topics include building a core team, preaching, reaching people, burnout, taking care of your family, and more. So I encourage you to go to newchurches.com to find out more. I think deconstruction happens. It's kind of like, I think the person who's going through it, usually it feels something like a breakdown. It happens when, the way I would define it is when when your faith is unable to be held as it is in face of some new reality. This is Tim Keller, pastor, theologian, and apologist for the Christian faith. So some new reality comes along that shakes you and feels like my faith actually doesn't have an answer to this or my faith doesn't explain this or my faith can't help me with this and it makes you question absolutely everything that's what deconstruction is everything including you know what we would call the core doctrines and the hope is that you can untangle the wrong beliefs that created the crisis from the from the core beliefs and the reason why it's so that the people see, well, the core beliefs, it's not that's not the problem. It was these other beliefs around it that I had, a lot of which are, you know, you could call them cultural ideologies or background beliefs. Many times they really weren't even taught to you. They were assumed by the community. They were kind of like they were caught more than taught. And so basically uh, deconstruction happens when uh, it's like, I guess it's an inability of your faith as held to face some new reality that comes along and makes you question the whole thing. Reconstruction happens when you're able to disentangle the, the frankly, the false beliefs from the core doctrines. Well, I, I am curious about some of the background beliefs that are relatively common, oh. but are false. But are there some other common background beliefs that need to be deconstructed that you've seen in your own ministry? Sure. And by the way, I'll, th- there's there's a thread running through all of them, but I won't tell you the thread until I'm done. One is that idea that basically all non-Christians are are basically worse than Christians. In other words, they're morally worse, they're less happy, they're less moral, they're they're less kind, and so on. That basically non-Christians are kind of a mess, or they 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 should be a kind of a mess. And then you find out that they're not. And that, by the way, is a real major well, you know, it's a doctrinal mistake. It's like it's like you don't believe in the doctrine of common grace. But I'll, I'll, I'll give you the thread in a minute. Another another background belief is the idea that if you're a Christian and now you have the Holy Spirit, you will never mess up in a massive way. You're never really going to mess up in a really big way. God will help you and you will not do anything really bad. And when you uh, a lot of Christians have a re- deconstruction when they fa- when they commit adultery or they embezzle or they do something that shocks them that they didn't think they were capable of. A third kind of belief would be actually when a Christian, especially a you know a Christian with a really good reputation, really wrongs you and sm- and really really wrongs you in a very bad way. 
which makes you start to question, oh gosh, maybe Christianity doesn't really change people. Maybe Christians are just like anybody else and therefore the whole thing's a sham. A fourth one actually is uh, already mentioned, and which is suffering. That happens all the time. Everybody gets shaken by suffering, everybody, everybody who's a Christian. But some people say, I just don't think I can believe in God anymore because their understanding of how much suffering you're allowed to have if you're, if you're a Christian. I mean, they say, look, if I, if I was God, I, I would not let my people suffer like that. A fifth one, I think I'm down to five. A fifth one actually is leaders, failure of leaders. That you don't have a theology that can handle the idea of a leader. It's, it's similar to the others, but where a, a, a Christian leader really, really lets you down in a major, major way. An awful lot of deconstruction happens then. And I think uh, it's because the background belief there is similar to the others. It's just like a real, a real Christian leader wouldn't be like that. And therefore, maybe they're all like that. I mean, it's the reason why people stop going to doctors when they actually get in the hands of a quack. And they actually begin to question the entire medical profession. And they don't trust anyone after that. They don't trust anybody at all. And they were naive in their trust of, of medicine, but then, it's, then they moved to the other extreme. Now, what's the thread? What do you think, Trev? Any idea? I mean, well, to me, it seems like there's, there's a thread of minimizing common grace yep. in the world and maximizing a, a, a moral sense of superiority yep. in the church. Yeah, which is minimizing great, special grace. It, it's minimized. Yeah. It's a it's a moralism and legalism inside where you basically believe that what saves you and takes you to heaven is that you're a good person. And then it's also you're right. So it, it minimizes common grace outside and it also minimizes special grace on the inside. Yeah. So it's I mean, and I you know what? I think your listeners, Trevin, if they know anything about me, they're going to be shocked when they hear me say it's a failure to grasp the gospel. <laughs> so you've never said that before to oh, never this is the first time here at Trevin wax is a uh you know a podcast but no it's it's a failure to really you know the, people say oh i believe you're saved by grace not by good works but then they actually don't believe it they actually don't that's not how the heart works and all of these in some ways all of these false beliefs are come from a failure to grasp the implications of the gospel so do you think pastors ought to be deconstructing these false beliefs constantly in order to prepare people for when that could happen so that so that it's not such a crisis of faith when some of these things do happen yeah in preaching it should be you should be you should know about these things so that you're able i mean i gave you such a long list a lot of these things come up a lot and you need to say hey this reminds us that and i and the reason to do that by the way is because i do think that even uh, again, I didn't come up in the evangelical hothouse. An evangelical hothouse means you're raised in an evangelical church. You go to evangelical youth groups. You know, maybe when you're in college, you may go to Christian college, or maybe you go to a you're in a very evangelical campus ministry. But that 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 evangelical hothouse is porous now because of social media. In other words, you can't really protect your kids growing up. If they have those kind of false background beliefs, that moralism, basically, and that misunderstanding of how grace works, they're going to get knocked out. So you are going to have to teach them. So, I mean, the answer is counter catechesis. And, you know, that I use that term to mean you can't just teach the gospel or the Trinity. You don't just teach the doctrine, but you always show how cultural narratives question that doctrine, how the doctrine actually deconstructs the cultural narrative. So you ought to be deconstructing cultural narratives with the gospel all the time. So the answer is, yeah, you really do have to be preparing your people. And that's mainly through the teaching of the word, I think. I, I tell pastors to always be asking the question when they're doing exegesis, what's the edge here? Like how, how does the world says this, but the Bible says this? Because it, it, it's yeah. easy at times, I think, to just to think you're just expositing a text by doing it in a really general way, but without the the without the edge of conflict and i don't mean in a in a combative contrarian way only but in in seeking to get underneath to show this is how this stands against the world but it's actually for the good of the world you know back to the subversive fulfillment um, and and whatnot in case you're not familiar with these terms let me explain them briefly when tim mentions counter catechesis 
He's referring to the need to teach Christian truth in a way that directly counters false narratives delivered by the world. Older historical catechisms in the Protestant tradition were generally focused on teaching Christian doctrine as opposed to the largely Catholic society or Catholic past that was prevalent. What Keller says we need today is Christian teaching that catechizes believers, that teaches Christian truth in ways counter to the prevalent worldview of our time. So you'd learn doctrine and how it stands against the prevalent idea of expressive individualism, that the purpose of life is to look within yourself, to define yourself, and then express yourself to the world. The term subversive fulfillment refers to a way of presenting the gospel that gets at the deep longings of people in a culture, but shows how the world's way of fulfilling those longings is built on lies and distortions. What's needed is a way of presenting the gospel that subverts the idolatries of our day, while showing people how the gospel fulfills the deeper longings in the human heart. In my book, This Is Our Time, I describe it as bringing the light of the gospel on the cultural myth so that the lies are exposed, but the longings that made people fall for those lies are fulfilled. I asked Tim what pitfalls we should avoid in seeking to renew the church and see more people come to faith. I don't believe all the reasons why the church has declined are in the church. I don't think that's true. I, be- I do believe there have been forces in the culture that have done a lot to try to weaken the church and try to marginalize the church. So it's not all our fault, as it were. On the other hand, that we're the ones we have control over. So I think you're right in saying, what what do we, what should we avoid? Here's three things to avoid. Okay, one is both the liberal first and then the conservative later churches tied themselves totally to a particular political agenda. You know, the liberal churches started doing it in the '60s and '70s to the liberal democratic agenda, and the conservatives, starting in the '80s and '90s, tied themselves to a very conservative Republican agenda. And what it does is to the vast middle, you might say, of the of the 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 country. And I know the middle even is divided, but nevertheless, the vast middle of the country seems like the church doesn't look like they're speaking to they're not really speaking to the transcendent questions. They're just a power block. So over politicization, I guess number two is the liberal the don't don't do the liberal mistake, which is In order to stop the decline, we're going to have to get rid of some orthodox doctrines. And we're just going to have to get rid of that. You know, uh, now, obviously, liberals did that a long time ago. Liberal Protestant got rid of the authority of the Bible and the deity of Christ and the bodily resurrection. But it's still there. It's still a major temptation. Right now, most evangelicals are getting pressured to be open and affirming about gay unions and and same-sex marriage and so forth. That's the second mistake, I think, that you have to avoid, and that is the idea that we really have to, we we just can't, the orthodoxy of the past, we're going to have to basically get rid of to some way. That's the liberal mistake. But the third mistake, which is more of a conservative mistake, and I think this is the one right now, is that Christians, orthodox Christians, have lost hope that orthodox Christianity can thrive and grow in a secular, hostile environment. It just, that, in other words, uh, there, there's arguing over, do we withdraw, do we get combative, what, but nobody actually thinks we can really start growing again, that we can really thrive. And that's the, that right now, that's the conservative mistake. So those are three. Yeah, that's, that's when we make maintenance the mission. Let's just maintain what we have, and that's seen as successful rather than you know, just trying to keep thriving to- from losing what we already have. That's right. As opposed to any real hope of being able to thrive and grow. That's right. And, and persuade other people. Yeah, persuasion. Yeah. yeah. Persuasion. Wow. What an idea. Yeah. What an idea. It's amazing. So so let's fast forward 50 years. It, it, if you could envision what, what would a renewed church look like in the West, uh, what, what would that look like? And what do you think the effect would be on, on the surrounding society? Well, I think you'll probably still be in it, though. You'll be pretty old, and I won't be. Okay, but would you <laughs> If like I'm to... still in it, I'll be really old. <laughs> well, I know you'd be really old, but on the other hand, you might be. <laughs> Whereas I can tell you, I will not be. That's all. Would you like us to go beyond that? I mean, do you think I should talk more than whether Trevin will be alive or not? Okay. okay. Well, okay, they give us 75 years, because I'm pretty sure oh. I won't be around then. 
Okay. Well, I think if, if it's going to be, if it's going to be renewed, yeah, one is, I already mentioned, it would still be orthodox in its doctrine. It would be recognizably in line with, it would still take the Nicene Creed literally. <laughs> it would still believe in the full authority of the Bible. It would still believe in the, you know, the solas, the five, you know, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. Okay. Secondly, it would have continued to balance like all renewed churches always have on the gospel between legalism and antinomianism on the on the two hands. In other words, it would not have gotten into legalism, but it would also not get into relativism. And that's always been a kind of balancing act for renewed churches. And churches lose their renewed energy the more they slide down the slope toward legalism or down toward relativism and antinomianism. So they, they keep that balance. Thirdly, they will have learn how to evangelize secular people and people of other religions so they're growing faster than the population. Okay? In other words, if you if you actually learn how, in a pretty good way, to, to evangelize secular people and non-Christian, not, not uh, people of other religions, you will grow. I mean, in the past, church grew when it knew how to evangelize Christendom people. It, it knew how to evangelize people who had been basically prepared by a nominally Christian society to have a certain amount of respect for the Bible and certain background beliefs, like there is a God, there's a heaven and hell. And we were very good at that. And we knew how to do that for 500 years, but we do not know how to do secular uh, people and people of other religions, and we will have learned by then, okay? And number four, I guess, would be a strong connection to the global non-Western church with a highly multi-ethnic leadership here in New in America, okay? So I would be strongly connected. Right now, we're not very connected to the global non-Western church, but we would be very strongly connected. And I guess, oh, all right, I'll give you one more. Christians in this church would be, in the church would be famous for being more generous with their money and time and more dedicated to the poor and the marginalized than any other group of people. And so there's five. And if they were really renewed, we'd, we'd be famous for that. You know, we'd be connected in that way. We'd be growing because of the evangelists. We would avoid the two problems of losing the gospel, and we'd stay orthodox. So the steps to take toward that is to, I mean, if that's what the future of the church might look like, if a renewed church looks like that in the year 2100, let's say, then then the steps to take toward that are to go ahead and begin moving in those directions now connection to the global church yeah generosity of spirit recognizing our our responsibility to uh to to those with with fewer resources and whatnot to, to begin moving in that direction now th i mean those are just some practical things that we could begin doing yeah to build toward that future it won't be easy so for example when i mentioned the really really drilling down on evangelism really saying how do we do that at the same time moving into the position of being famous for being dedicated to the poor and the marginalized right now those are polarizing matters I, I i see the people who are just talking about social justice all the time as not being anywhere near as concerned about evangelism and vice versa i just i just don't see it i mean they they really really are sort of dividing that's one problem of course i also do see tendencies toward legalism of the especially we already talked about this, you know, the people who feel like, gosh, it's so hostile out there or relativism where you say, if we're going to get a hearing, we're just going to have to get rid of some things. So, so I actually don't feel like we're unified at thinking that we ought to go forward on those things. So I, one of our biggest right. problems, Trevin, is, is, is just, is just the, a, a lack of, I don't know where somebody is saying, let's move out on all these. It's people have sort of picked these things off. It's almost like you need all, all those vitamins, but people have their own one vitamin and they're throwing bricks at anybody they think doesn't have this, and you know, doesn't talk enough about this one thing, you know, so. So, it's, yeah, you're right. You're totally right. But I, I, at this point, I don't know. I don't see anybody leading us in that direction very well. So. You you have written a lot and you've talked a lot about the the Clapham group. Uh, yeah. William Wilberforce, they, how, how they brought about cultural renewal through a, a, a gospel-centered activism. They kept obviously together a lot of the things that you're talking about here. You've written about the lessons we can take from their example, but I'm curious in 
what are some ways in which the current situation is going to be different from theirs? I mean, obviously they're more in a Christendom environment, but right. would would require us to take some of those lessons, but maybe apply them differently or in alternative ways. Great question. The things you learn is the Clapham group was, uh, they took a long time to produce. I mean, it took year. They took, worked for years together to produce a lot of the things they produced. They based it all on friendships and community, not just Zoom calls and Gantt charts. You know, I mean, it was it, they r- relationships and community. So they were, a- and third, there were very different kinds of leaders overlapping. This is what you know. I got this from James Hunter. Overlapping networks of capital. Not just business types, not just ministry types, not just artist types, not just, you know, in other words, everybody, all kinds of people had very different kinds of expertise, you might say, or skills. But, okay, having said all that, we're in a different situation. And here's what some of those differences are. One is, I don't think society is as controlled by a single small little inbred elite. I mean, back then, there really was a fairly small number of people. They all knew each other. You know, they were kind of like wealthy people and aristocrats. I mean, uh, Britain was much more run by a single little elite. You know, you know, you. I hate to tell you this, Trevor. This would be very upsetting to you, I'm sure. But you know, if you were a Baptist, you couldn't go to Oxford or Cambridge until like up to the 1850s. Did you know that? If you because you weren't a member of the Church of England, so you couldn't go. Yeah, to I. Did you know that? I I I just I just discovered that my. By uh, one of my my great great grandfathers on my mother's side is uh, William Whitaker, the the Anglican divine, uh, who who wrote a against Bellarmine on sola scriptura and whatnot. And I found out that his grandson was removed from Cambridge Cambridge for being a dissenting minister. That's right. So so that uh, a little bit closer to my generation, yeah. I don't know if he was Baptist, but he was dissenter at least, and was not able to get his degree at Cambridge for that very reason. No, so, and that, you yeah. see why that kept that, that that kept the elite circle. I mean, because if you didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge, then you didn't know anybody who, I mean, so, you know, par, I mean, it was, it was really simpler if you had to, to change the culture. It just actually was simpler to change the culture because you had a much smaller circle and there was a much tighter circle of people who basically ran everything. And we are way, way less... Uh, centralized in spite of the fact that we actually do we we're probably more centralized than people like to think there really are a lot yeah i mean you know when you look at the supreme court and everybody went to harvard or yale <laughs> you know say, yeah. wait, wait a minute so it's but but it's still not it's nothing like it and i do think therefore cultural change is way way more way more difficult uh, number two we have the cultural problem of sex that they didn't have there was a, there was a, you, you already alluded to this, Travis, you were actually right about this, but there was a nominal Christianity. And so evangelicals and nominal Christians, you know, had basically the same view of sexuality. May, may, usually the evangelicals practiced it <laughs> and the nominals didn't, but they all said, yeah, you know, uh, homosexuality is wrong and, and uh, you should, you know, you shouldn't commit adultery and all that. But we actually have the challenge of telling a new, compelling story about sexuality that will counter the sex's authenticity and liberation, which is what secular culture tells. Right now, the the secular story about sex is so powerful. It makes us look so incredibly unhealthy, myopic, oppressive, that it's a big problem. They did not have that problem. Evangelicals in in the Clapham time were seen as goody two shoes, you know, happy clappy, you know, a little too emotional. In other words, they, they, there were there were um, ways in which the culture looked down at evangelicalism, and but nothing like our culture does. And we have ser- therefore some major major, uh, uh, you might say, I would say, cultural apologetic challenges we haven't even begun to address. And therefore, yeah, I, I don't think it's this, it's just not the same. It's not going to be, it's not, we're not just going to be able to get together and start magazines and get a few, get a few, you know, I mean, the big hairy goal of slavery was sort of like, they did a whole lot of other things, but then they also worked to repeal slavery. And we, I don't think have any sort of cutting edge at this point goal that if we reached it, the whole society would be grateful. So anyway, yeah, it's very, very different. And I, 
I certainly don't enshrine them as like the, uh, you know, just if we could just get back to that. But they, they can teach us a lot. It's clear from this conversation that Tim Keller believes the road ahead for renewing the church and evangelizing the lost will be difficult. It's a steep climb. There are many challenges. But in the end, we have hope because we serve a God who knows the way out of the grave. When you remove the rot from the church and examine the foundations, when you strip away sin and excess and man-made tradition and cultural assumptions, you arrive trembling before the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The what of Christianity is a who. We are not a political action committee. We are not a fill-up station for people seeking vague spirituality. We are not a club designed for inspiration, not a class delivering information. We are people who confess the name. We are his family, the household of God, a holy nation, the commonwealth of heaven, exiles and sojourners, his little flock, the first fruits of new creation, the fellowship of the justified, people of the word who follow his way. If you find it hard to believe in the goodness of the church because of so many high-profile scandals, consider instead the beautiful manifestations of holiness you see in the people closest to you, people whose names will never grace the history books, but who have been faithful in Bible reading, in praying, in passing on the faith to the next generation. Don't look at the most prominent, but the plodding pastors, whose names most of us will never know, but who demonstrate faithfulness in a thousand little ways. The ones who never shock the world with surprising scandal, but go unnoticed to their graves, having displayed the quiet marks of enduring love and faithfulness. These two make up the church. In simple, quiet faithfulness to God and his people, that's what we must pursue, come what may. We'll be right back. I want to take a minute to mention again my new book, The Thrill of Orthodoxy. It stands on some pretty tall shoulders. Men and women from previous generations who who wrote in powerful and profound ways about the relevance of Christianity. Uh, There's G.K. Chesterton. He's the one who showed me the narrowness of heresy, the whirling roller coaster ride of Christian theology through the ages. Uh, There's Dorothy Sayers, reminding me of the drama of dogma. Why, there's adventure not in adapting the faith to better fit people, but adapting people to better fit the faith. And then there's C.S. Lewis, of course, his influence on how I understand the essentials of Christianity, why the true faith endures. And there are others throughout church history, Augustine, Aquinas, the Reformers, leaders like John Stott. But I dedicated the book to my parents because they introduced me to Jesus. They passed along the treasure of Christian truth. And I hope that if you're listening, you want to pass on the treasure of Christian truth to the next generation as well. So I hope you'll check out the thrill of orthodoxy, that it will encourage you, that it will support you, and that it will strengthen your faith. Darkness. It's just the dark. 
There will not be a renewal of the church in North America without a renewed confidence in and commitment to the Word of God. Which raises the question, how well are we doing in our study and application of the Bible? Here's Jen Wilkin again. Let me just give an analogy, if I can. When my daughter wanted to become a chemist, what she did not do is gather with a group of her peers and have a feelings-level discussion of a chemistry textbook. She believed there were very real consequences for getting it wrong and very real benefits for getting it right. And so she found a place where she could receive really good instruction, where there was a peer component to it, but where it required a lot of work from her as well. She went to an institute of higher education and she got a chemistry degree that she worked really hard for. When we think about the Bible, we don't think about it that way. We don't, we, we would acknowledge that we think that there are high stakes for getting it wrong and, and a lot of benefits for getting it right. But the way that we think about formation as it regards the Bible is disconnected from that. Many of us have had, have been given an over-spiritualized view of what the Bible does or how we interact with it. We think that just because we are faithful to sit down and open it up, that the Holy Spirit is just going to plop truth on us. I'm not saying that that never happens when we interact with the scriptures, but to make that normative is to miss the fact that the Bible has been given to us in a particular form. It's a medium. Reading is a medium. Words on a page is a medium. And the Lord could have communicated truth to us through any medium he desired. He could have just communicated truth directly into our spirits. You know, he could have, but that's not what he did. He gave us a form of a medium that actually implies discipline to be able to understand. There is a church in my area that is actually very good at raising the bar. They start raising the bar when their kids are in middle school and high school. And by the time the kids in their church graduate from high school, they will have gone through Old Testament theology New Testament theology, and they will have a good sense of systematic theology as well. That church is exploding in numbers. They have raised the bar in discipleship. And do you know what that church is? It's the Mormon church. And so the question I would have for us is, why don't we believe that this book that we're staking our lives on is worthy of raising the bar? Discipline is not dead. It just follows the most compelling message. And I think that those of us who are in a position to implement or to uphold Christian education, we should compel them. If we think this thing is as beautiful as we say that it is, we should compel them. Our members are committing to run marathons, to do Whole30. They have discipline. Not only that, but they're willing to spend a lot of money and time to put their kids in sports that take up a umpty zillion numbers of hours during the week. They commit to gyms. They commit to all kinds of things. And so when the church says, hey, here's your Bible, spend five minutes a day or 15 minutes a day reading this devotional and these two verses that I pulled out for you, we've communicated a value to what we're doing. In many cases, what we have said is, we're going to let you be thoroughly catechized by all of these other things that you've sunk time into the other six days of the week, and then for 30 minutes on Sunday morning and five or 10 minutes in in your daily practice, we're going to say that we're going to give you access to the most important formative tool that you'll have in this lifetime. It doesn't make sense. Time. Growth in holiness and wisdom takes time. Renewing the church will take time. And unless we are patient, we will not see this renewal take place. And patience doesn't come easy to us in North America. Ajith Fernando pointed out this challenge. I think one of the great blessings that the West gave the rest of the world came out of the Industrial Revolution with its emphasis on productivity, on efficiency. And Christianity had, I think, a lot to do with it. The Reformation had a lot to do with it because it gave people a sense of value that made them work and there was a work ethic that developed. But along along the way, I think one of the things that efficiency did was it made lingering difficult. Whereas Christianity is a religion where people linger. They linger with God. You know, our time with God is not just quick, 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 highly organized time. But we are lingering with the one who loves us. 
And, and I think we are losing some of those things in our time with God. Our, our friendship, pursuing friendship, I think, again, our friendships have become very structured. You have small groups that meet uh, for, a, for a given period of time. They follow a given curriculum. And once that curriculum is complete, we think that the work of discipling is over. But if you look at the method of Jesus, he spent hours, days, hiding. He would go to Gentile areas and hide with his disciples, just chatting. Because worldview is something that is imbibed. Of course, it comes from the word. And that is why the word has always got to be primary. But also word based conversation, conversation, a chatting with a foundation of biblical truth is the way in which the word can become real, can become internalized in people's lives. I think that a structured, a highly structured style of discipling can make people miss out on some of that. So there is a need for people to linger. And I think for us, I, I mean, uh, uh, I have been influenced a lot by the West and efficiency, working hard is one of those things that I learned from the West. But I have had to learn that in my schedule, or you would say schedule, we have to have times when we can linger, linger with friends, linger with the people who we disciple as, as a community of people who are growing in Christ. So that is something I think we desperately need to recover. A lot of people are talking about discipling today and the need for discipling, but very few are doing it. And I think one of the main reasons for this is that it takes time. It just takes a lot of time and people are not willing to give that time. I think that Christian discipleship, the lowering of the bar, has been a capitulation on the part of church leaders to an instant gratification, individualistic culture. We have said, if everyone is making it easier, then we have to as well. But anything we've ever done of value has cost us something. It has cost us time and effort money. We have invested a lot in the things that we have wanted to be not just proficient at, but excellent at. And I want to be excellent at being a follower of Christ. I want to look like him as much as possible. But there isn't a quick fix. I think you will initially see some things that you didn't think were in there that will help you deal with some of the top of mind theological concerns that you have. But you're going to have to be patient with the process. Patience is a, is a vanishing virtue if not a vanished virtue in the church. But it's again, it's all over the scriptures and something that we're called to, even in this, particularly in this. All three of my guests mentioned patience. Tim Keller talked about how the Clapham group was playing the long game, giving not just months or years, but decades to their goals. Ajith Fernando talked about Christianity as a religion of lingering. And Jen Wilkins said we must recapture the virtue of patience. If we are to see the church renewed in our generation, we will need patience and perspective. I think we lack perspective. A lot of young, especially younger Christians lack perspective in, in a several ways. Uh, even though my traveling days are over, I had about five or six years after I left Redeemer where I was traveling the world, going to you know all these different continents, all these different places and seeing Christianity and realizing that the United States' problems are really just one, country, just one country, and that all of the various countries face challenges, and all the churches are flawed in some ways. But by getting out of the United States and being connected to others, you very often, you know, the church is stronger in one other country than the United States in certain points, but also weaker in some points. And it gives you much more of a sense of, okay, Christianity is really, there's really no alternative to Christianity. Because I mean, everybody's saying the church is the answer and the problems aren't over, it's, there, it's not like you can't overcome them because in that country, they pretty much have. They're not, the problems we have here in America, oh, they don't have them over there. And so that that's one problem, I think, a lack of perspective, a lot of a US 
Christian people who are deconstructing, I'm so upset. They lack that perspective. Secondly, I'd say church history. One of the things that you realize when you go through church history is, is the church waxes and wanes. It thrives and does major, major wonderful works and then goes through bad times. And again, that's that's the other perspective. You need a, you might say, you, you need a global perspective and a historical perspective, and it does help. One of the goals of this podcast has been to provide you with perspective, to connect you to the global church and the church throughout history so that we can draw from fresh resources as we seek to renew the church in our day. As painful as this season of humiliation may be, we must acknowledge this path is the road to humility. Perhaps when some of the societal privileges we've taken for granted are stripped away, or when the trappings of worldly prestige and status disappear, we will find ourselves in a place of desperate dependence on the only one with true spiritual power. Humbled, we drop to our knees in prayerful, quiet desperation. The renewal of the Church will be known not for its celebrity and fame, but faithful service in the vineyard of the Lord. Men and women march not by the scepter of status, but by the shovel of service. And after the storms of humiliation blow through, the garden of humility will be refreshed by the sun, and the flowers of renewed dependence on God will blossom again. I had a dream that I was waking at the burning edge of dawn and i could see the fields of glory i could hear the sower's song i had a dream that i was awake at the burning edge of dawn and all that rain had washed me clean all the sorrow was gone i had a dream that i was awake at the burning edge of dawn and i could finally Reconstructing Faith is a podcast powered by the North American Mission Board. If this podcast is helpful to you, it would be helpful to us if you leave a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening to and share it with your friends. You can find downloadable episode discussion guides to help you have good conversations about these topics. Find a link to each episode's discussion guide in the show notes on your preferred podcast platform or by visiting reconstructingfaithpodcast.com. Reconstructing Faith is written by Trevin Wax. Our show is produced and edited by Scott Slusher. Our sound design is composed, mixed, and mastered by Dan Phelps. Aaron Leslie handles audio editing and engineering. Story editing and consulting is by Amy Simpson. Please check out my book, The Thrill of Orthodoxy, Rediscovering the Adventure of Christian Faith. Thank you for listening.